Well, that's fine. Uh, I don't care if they see that. There you go. I mean, they already know if they're not here or not. Right. All right and this one's called Fuse Safety. Pretty short, but it's pretty cool. When a fuse blows in a cutout, it happens so fast that it's easy to overlook the hazards it creates. To see what's actually happening, I replace a standard fuse barrel with this clear one. When the fuse blows, it's designed to cut the path of electricity on the circuit, then extinguish the arc inside the barrel. The hot gases shoot straight down towards the worker and can cause injury if the appropriate precautions aren't taken. OSHA and NESE require employees to wear the appropriate eye protection, use voltage-rated tools, and stand clear of the fuse barrel's exhaust path while operating a cutout. NLC also recommends using a telescopic stick to operate a cutout from the ground when possible. I'm going to restart that right there and uh, give it a pause to give you a little bit more information right here. It's easy to overlook the hazards it creates. To see what's actually happening, I replace a standard fuse barrel with this clear one. When the fuse blows, it's as Now you'll notice right here, when the fuse blows, and I, man, this is super slow motion when they're doing this, is the electrical path, as far as the gases and everything that's going up through the fuse belt right here, there's still current flow all the way through the tube, even though the fuse has come out. Once the barrel falls completely open, that's when current path is broken. Now watch what happens at the bottom of the fuse barrel. Designed to cut the path. All, right, all of this right here that you see in the sparkle parts, that's molten metal. So you definitely don't want to be underneath that. Uh, we had the general practice that if we had, well, for one thing, and then Professor V jumped in on this too, we did not close fuses with a climber on the pole. Right. Yeah, uh, if there's anybody climbing a pole, we never closed and uh, typically never opened a fuse with a climber on the pole because obviously if you're down here in this area, you're gonna get showered with a bunch of uh, molten metal and it's gonna get extremely hot. Uh, also, if you're working in a congested area, say uh, by the road and there's a lot of cars underneath it, it's, it's a good practice to go ahead and get in contact and try to find those people with those cars to see if you can get them to move them. Yeah. Path of electricity on the circuit. Okay, and you see the tail of the fuse, is, it's whipping. So when you see this arc area, going all the way through here, power is still on. Air is conducting electricity all the way through this area right here. Once the barrel completely opens. Then extinguish the arc inside the barrel. The hot gases shoot straight down towards the worker and can cause injury if the appropriate precautions aren't taken. Okay, once the barrel completely opens, then you know you've got de-energized, a de-energized condition. Another thing that's inside the fuse, the fuse itself, uh, right about in this area when the fuse is in the tube, there's a spring that's inside the fuse itself. And that spring helps with the ejection of the fuse when it flies out of the bottom. Uh, most of the fuse, when it does blow, is either melted or falls away. That spring gets fired out of the bottom of the barrel and will go straight down to the ground. Out of all the things that are inside that barrel, that's probably one of the most potent. So when somebody's closing a fuse, one, don't be in the ground underneath it or on the pole. Uh, stand clear of it. Get out of the way. And I have seen that spring in, embedded in faces and arms. I mean, you're looking at what, five, 6,000 degrees when that thing's heated up. Mm -hmm. And that thing fires out of the bottom and uh, does, does some major damage. So safety wise, where are we gonna be when we close a fuse? Not under it, out to the side. Uh, well, not under the side. Now, the safe thing as far as you closing a fuse, obviously you guys have done this. When you're out there, well, almost all of you have done this. When you're closing with an extension stick, you're over in this area over here. So all the gases and fire is gonna fire out away from you down at that angle. If you're up in a bucket truck, and I'll try to find a video of that one, you're gonna be more out to the front in closing a video, I mean, closing a, a fuse barrel. 
So that's going to keep you away from the ejection. The, what is what safety measures are you going to use here as far as your PPE? Rubber gloves, hard hat, glasses, everything. Rubber hat, hard hat, glasses. Uh, Paul says everything, so you're going to wear your chainsaw chaps. <laughs> <laughs> no. All I right. think you think you know. I'm just making funny. I think out of, out of the normality there, I uh, typically you're going to be working a good bit of the time, especially when you're up in an energized pole. You're going to have your hard hat, safety glasses, rubber gloves, fire retardant clothing, and boots on. There's one thing that you'll see extra that Lyman put on, and that's hearing protection. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of Lyman out there that like those foam roll up hearing prote hearing protection to put in. And would actually put muffs over that. It's loud. It is uh, explosive. Uh, you, you don't really, and this is something you know we'll talk about in the next part in the uh, next course. Here is you're going to get. Well, we'll talk about it now. You're going to get a hearing test when you go into your organization, and that hearing test is going to be the baseline for the beginning of your career. Then once a year, you're going to get a physical. And if your hearing degrades in that one year period, you're going to get tested again by a professional uh, person that does testing for hearing. And if that is not resolvable right there, because you've been around so much loud noises and whatnot, guess what happens? You get terminated. No, it's considered an injury. Well, it is considered a preventable injury. And you probably won't get an increase. You probably won't get a promotion. And, you know, it, it's not a good day. I think out of all things, I mean, you cut yourself, you know, you cut yourself. Something falls on you and hurts you. You know that you stub your toe or twist your ankle. You know it right away. Hearing is kind of one of those things that creeps up on you after long-term exposure to, to loud noise. So how do we determine when we need hearing protection? What's, what's the general rule out there? It, it's a really simple thing. You think you can need it. Use it. When you think you can need it. Anybody else? I agree. <laughs> exposed to loud noises for a long period of time. But what, what, and how do you determine if that noise is loud enough to have hearing protection? In the best anytime noise. you're around big equipment or uh, anytime you risk being around an arc flash. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, you're all kind of touching on bass, but there's really no <laughs> technical, well, I don't know, you know, kind of information. That, well, is that loud enough? Is a trencher too loud? Is a mini excavator too loud? Is a line truck running at full throttle too loud? I just don't know. I don't have a meter out there to, to uh, measure the decibels or the amount of sound that it's making. The good safety rule of thumb and what you'll hear from safety uh, directors is if I come up to Mr. Snelling out there in the field and we're standing talking with each other and Mr. Snelling cannot hear what I'm saying or understand, that's when you need to put hearing protection on. So it's a simple conversation. If you have to raise your voice to speak with someone that's standing beside you or in front of you, then you're going to need to have hearing protection. So that's just a good rule of thumb of when it's, when it's required. So just be aware of that, guys. You know, hearing degrades over time. And you, you would think, well, you know, a fuse blowing, huh, it's, it's going to be pretty quick. Uh, you can give it a day or two. You know, my hearing's going to heal itself. And in you young guys, Professor V, yeah, it probably will. <laughs> but once you start getting around in those 30s and you know stuff like that, it's going to degrade. And if you want to, you know, if you want to keep your hearing in good shape right now, go ahead and put hearing protection on every time that you have the potential for loud noise. Yeah, but that's well, a good. What if you already have hearing problems already? Uh, you might not be able to get a job. Mm. Okay. Yeah, you got to be within a certain threshold. Now, 
I don't know how, how you've got your volume turned up on your, to hear me, but if you're hearing a simple conversation here right now, your chances are probably good. You're going to be okay. Uh, you've got to have hearing assistance now. <clears throat> you may have some difficulties. Gotcha. Okay. Good deal. All right. So that's, that's the one video that I wanted to show you today. And the, you know, the big safety things that are around that. Now I had this one and it's kind of cool also. It really is a uh, advertisement for uh, recoding insulators, but I wanted you to see this just to be aware of what to look out for if you come up on a situation like this. Flash over an explosion of high voltage insulator and electrical substation without mid-sun mid -sun 570. Now the mid-sun 570 is the treatment they're putting on these insulators. This is kind of cool. You see what's happening there? Let me go slow motion. Half speed. It's happening all over the place. That's what they consider flashover. And eventually it's happening down here. You see the little bit of yellow that's going on. And eventually the flashover of the insulator becomes so intense that it flashes from the phase completely over the insulator to ground. And you'll see that happen right over here. Pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what's causing it? Storms, maybe? Sir? The storms causing that? Uh, no, sky's clear. I see some stars over here. Wind? The what? The wind? Uh, how's the wind doing that? Well, well, give me your explanation. I don't know. <laughs> saying how phases can the wind make movement in it cause a magnetic field. No, this is this is a solid post type insulator, so it's not moving at all. Here's um, the here's the conductor on the top. What was the other? People answer? purposely uh, pushing the systems. No, the voltage is remaining the same. We just started to get flash over here. Now, if you have something, if you have an insulator, say the insulator of this type, what do you think would make it conductive? And that's really what's happening right here. What is making this insulator conductive? The well, insulation has been compromised. The what has been compromised? The insulation has been compromised. By? Water. The elements. All right, say that again. Now that you got the feedback taken care of, by what? The elements. The elements. Okay. So like weather. Like water. Is, is it moisture in there? All right. Now we're getting you're getting somewhere. Now we got some moisture in the air. And then okay. what now obviously it's gonna rain on it. And that's yeah. not gonna make a track. So moisture and what else? Corrosion. Corrosion. Uh porcelain does not corrode. You guys because are hitting, not hitting that coat on there. there. Huh? But uh, with the uh, with the coat being gone, all the elements will play a big role that, on it. That's uh, you don't lose coating on this. You can improve on it, <laughs> but you don't lose coating on this. You guys are almost there. It's moisture and something else. Fog and wind. Moisture and fog. Fog is moisture. <laughs> moisture and wind or something. Okay. All right. Well, you guys are touching all uh, around base here. There's a couple different things that can go on here. It's moisture and dust. All right. Once you mix the moisture and dust and you get sand particles and dirt particles on this, this will make it go to degrade. Another thing, and I don't know the location of this, you, when we had uh, power lines up and down the boulevard in Myrtle Beach, Garden City, and North Myrtle Beach, this was a common occurrence, and we were starting to get pole fires from it. Now, why do I say proximity to the beach? Salt. Salt, salt spray, <laughs> gentlemen, salt spray. 
So the salt crystallizes on these insulators and then makes it very conductive up and down the insulator, right? So you got to have some type of contamination and that can contamination is happening right there. And usually it is tied with moisture. Now that's not to say during the course and I'm sure Professor V has seen this before. Yeah. Uh, I'll give Georgetown for an example. I don't know if anybody's driven through Georgetown, but have you seen the insulators that are on the poles down there? They are awful. What was once gray is now brown. And it's from all the, uh, I don't want to call it pollution. I mean, it's <laughs> not pollution, but it's from all the byproduct that's coming out of the stacks down there at Georgetown mm -hmm. that rests on the insulators. And if you have, it it's normally happens when you have like, you know, a good stretch of dry days and then a, then a drizzling rain, all that contamination then gets moist, gets wet, and it'll start tracking over the insulators. Same thing with the salt spray. So that's the typical cause of flashover. Yeah. Now, quick I'm question for you. Yep. Um, down there at the beach, I've noticed like uh, with the lines, you can hear it like sizzling almost. But I mean, obviously, it's not as you know bright as this or anything. But you can hear that noise. That's is that exactly. similar? Yeah, it is very similar. All right, it, it it's working on it now. That noise is trying trying to track over insulators. It's just not at the point where it's, you know, gotten this severe down in the situation. Now, uh, what what can help here is, and uh, Lyman kind of praise it, is if you start get tracking and you get a real hard rain. Mm -hmm. You know, you get about thirty minutes of a good hard rain. It washes all your insulators down, and it de actually doesn't happen anymore. That's because you wash the contaminants away. I, I will say also, and this is something to look out for. If uh, who said they heard the noise? Oh, okay, Cole. I did. You hear the noise, or if you see this happening and you approach it, approach it with caution. Okay, approach with caution. Uh, go back to this one. That looks pretty severe, and the where the cameraman is. Is probably where I would be and if I knew this was happening outside of my generating station I'd probably be calling people right away to tell them hey look we're about ready to have a flashover you need to de-energize this circuit mm -hmm. now you're going to be taking a lot of people out of power but the potential for damage like that well actually that took power off right there <clears throat> The potential for damage is so big that you're going to be spending more time working on it than you can uh, if you were just de-energized. Now, if you de-energize it, obviously, I'm not going to call MidSun 570 or whoever to come down there and uh, do anything with it. It's going to take too long. What can I do to help cure the situation? Wash them off. Yeah. De-energize it and wash them off. That, that's pretty plain and simple. Mm. Uh, there are methods out there that you can uh, actually do this energized with pecan shells and corn husks. Isn't that called hot washing? Uh-huh. It is. Uh, the, the pecan shells and the corn husks are, are granulated and you uh, fire them through a uh, air compression gun. It is pretty to watch. And that, what, what did you see? I mean, that's close to flashover. And yeah. I'm gonna go slow motion here. You can watch this real quick. The moisture that's on there, along with the contaminant, actually <coughs> bur burns itself dry. So actually, when it has the heating and you'll, you'll see smoke wisp off the side here, that's steam. Mm -hmm. 
See that right there? So the insulator actually dried itself and that steam rising off from the heating from the flashover. <laughs> pretty much goes through all of the uh, proceed procedures to add that coating onto the insulators. It does have more insulation value to it. Uh, and that's pretty much what it does. Any questions there on that one? Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. All right. Now, Professor V, I found this one. It's been a while to find it out. Professor V was talking the other day about working with transformers that have a bayonet fuse. And that's what's happening. That's what this guy is doing right here. The transformers in my field, you'll notice have a secondary switch, both the single phase and the three phase. Some transformers are made, that they have a fuse actually built inside of it. So this Lyman is uh, getting ready to replace the fuse inside this transformer. Uh, watch closely, he does it correctly. Where is he standing? Away from it. Opposite Away from side. the side. The fuse goes in the transformer in this direction. Okay. So he's standing to the side and he's going to throw the uh, bayonet fuse, the fuse into the transformer. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. Take it out. Take it out. Take it out. Ooh. Vent that thing. All right, vent that thing. He really doesn't need to because it's venting itself right out of the hole. But you'll, I don't know, it's, it's a hard to hear. Can you hear it? No. All right. Sure. When he puts it in, you can act, I can hear it on my side. The transformer starts to hum real loud, and you can actually hear boiling going on inside the transformer. It's because he's closed in on a fault. He's got a bad transformer. Okay, take it out. Take so the guy's telling him, take it out, take it out. Take it out, take it out. And then what happens? Oh. Uh, here comes all your oil. Now this one's, you know, pretty sublime right here. Uh, uh, that oil right there, if you're standing in front of it with that shotgun stick, for yeah. one thing, it's super heated. It's very, very hot now because you've got a fault going on inside the transformer. Uh, it's black. So you know a fault's occurring, you're starting to burn the oil and it will scorch you pretty hard if you're standing in front of it. Right. So it pulls the barrel real quick, pretty good lineman, does it real fast. Ooh. Vent that thing. And he, you know, vent that thing. Professor V was talking about venting the transformer. He's already got it vented. Yeah. The barrel's out of it. What did you take out? I told you it might make the road, but it didn't make the road, did it? Okay. <laughs> I told you it might make the road, but it didn't make the road, did it? So that's the good practice of installing and removing a bayonet type fuse. Always do it from the side. Okay. What do they need to do with this? Clean it up. Dig it up. Yep, you got to dig all of that up, clean up all the oil and the splash you made and uh, put it in a barrel and get it back to the service center for disposal. Okay, I don't this is kind of strange. Looks like they just buried a service and found a bad transformer. Mm -hmm. There, what, Dalton? Nobody puts baby in a corner. Oops, telephone. Telephone. Okay. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get back into the underground part. And that's the safety videos you have for this morning. Uh, I do want to go into some descriptions here of some of the equipment that we've talked about before. So everybody has been through the uh, underground training yard, correct? I'll take that as a yes. 
Yes, sir. All right. What do I have here up on the screen? Um, parking. Well, the, you called it a parking, uh, parking spot or something. Yeah, that, that, that's 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 one hundred percent correct. It's a parking stand, all right, or a parking standoff. So I can take my primary conductor, put it on here. Now, what is it meant to be used for? Feeding through or dead ending? Dead ending. Dead ending. Dead ending. So I can come to this point, put my load brake elbow on there for primary. And the wire is just going to come up to this point and stop. So do remember what this part is called. Parking standoff, parking stand, either one of the two. That's good terminology for the Lyman world. Not that one yet. What is this one? Double. Double. Eight, three. Well, who, who said double? Me. Right, is, that, is that like the double stuff in Oreos? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Cole. Feed through. Feed through. All right, so stand off. We're standing off the transformer. Feed through. So now I'm able to have one primary conductor in. There's a plate behind it. It's insulated in between. And then one feed coming back out. Now, where's the feed in go? Left. And where's the feed out go? Right. There you go. Good job, gentlemen. Now you've also seen this, don't get this confused. Here's the easy way of getting this confused. What is this? Silence. Silence. All right, do you remember the transformers that we have out there that are three phase? H1, H2, H3. <coughs> mm -hmm. All right, this is put inside of the transformer. I'm going to go to another transformer in just a moment because uh, Professor V brought it up and it, it is the normal practice nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to go into the transformer on this end and actually go in and out with primary conductor on this side. This is a way you're only using up one. Right. So this is a feed through insert. This inserts into the transformer. Okay. That's what we've been using on the transformers before. All right. This one's now, called what? Say again. This one's called a three phase pad mount transformer. Yeah, that's what it says right there. Okay, if I only have three bushings in a three-phase transformer, I'm going to have to use, oh no, I just killed it. I'm going to have to use that feed-through insert. If I have a transformer that has all six bushings in it, I just go in, my inbound conductor goes on the left-hand side and my right outbound conductor goes on the right hand side. So these are easily marked for you, gentlemen. H1A, H1B, H2A, H2B, H3A, H3B. So does A phase, where does A phase go? H1A and H2A. Oh, H2A. Okay. Uh, where does B phase go? H1B and H2B. H2B. Excellent. Where does C phase go? H3A and H3. H3. H3B. Yeah, H3B. Gets a little bit confusing because now I have six bushings that I have to pull off. But remember, the phases stay continuous as they go across. A, both sides. B, both sides. C, both sides. Now, this is a pretty full transformer going on here. What are all these things in here? Is that an area for like a parking stand? There you go. Yeah. 
you can put multiple parking stands in there so you can uh, stand off all three phases or actually all six phases at one time. You're normally not gonna do that, but it is possible. Uh, like Professor V before said uh, the other day also, I mean, these things are easy to access. Look how big the doors open. Mm -hmm. Top open, the top opens up and you're good to go. Okay. So I just want to give you another photograph or picture of a three phase transformer, not like the one that we have out there at the field. Uh, let me get one more here. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, it was a good one. Uh, somebody's phone's ringing. All right. So I have another one right here. Three phases in, three phases out, A, B, C, and this one, you see these on top? What do we call these from the other video before? I have one of these for each phase. An army man puts it at the end of his rifle. Bayonet fuse. Bayonet fuse. So I have one for A phase, and they're marked. It's hard to see in this picture. They're marked A phase. B phase and C phase. You'll also notice this plate underneath. If I do have oil leakage, it's not oil and rubber don't mix. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna degrade rubber. So they got this plate, drip plate, to put oil over here just in case it does spill and doesn't get on your uh, elbow conductions and conductor. Okay. Big things to remember right here because we're gonna get further into this. What's that called? Standoff. Standoff and it dead ends primary. What is that one called? Feed through. Feed through. It feeds through primary. All right. It's about 940. It's 938. Let's take about a 12 minute break and come back at 950. 950. There you go. So we have gone through thus far the two methods to determine. Uh, which span we have bad and underground primary. Who remembers what those two are? Can you repeat that real quick? Yeah, sure. We have uh, gone through two methods and that they are the two methods to determine if we have a bad span of underground primary. And what are those two things? High potting and underground fault indicator. Okay, so you can high pot. That's when you don't have underground fault indicators and then fault indicators. Okay, so those are our two methods. Now, I want you guys to put down your notes and of course it'll be on your video here. There's three steps that you need to follow when you're in the process of restoration of underground primary. And the three steps are Identify. It's a sloppy D. All right. Isolate. And then restore. If you follow these three steps in order, it'll make your whole life a lot easier. I mean, it's, it's very important to keep that in your mind. First, I need to identify the bad span. I need to isolate the bad span and then I need to restore. So we're gonna go through a couple of scenarios here. We're, because it's raining, I'm gonna do this here online. And then we're actually gonna go out to the field. Professor Vermelin's gonna take a group. I'm gonna take a group and we're gonna go through you guys in pairs because this typically happens in a pair of people when you're out there in the world doing line work of these three steps, identification, isolation, and restoration. And we're actually gonna do it in the uh, transformers and enclosures that we have out there in the field. And that will be graded. All right, so file, new, let's say. So I'm gonna draw up a couple of scenarios here. And the first one, I'm gonna keep this single phase to start. It just makes things so much simpler in the process. I'm gonna have a dip hole. How many transformers, Professor V? Four. 
Okay. Then I'm going to have another dip pole. And you notice I'm saying dip pole, dip pole. We don't have risers here. Here's my overhead line coming in on this side. And here's an overhead line coming in on this side. And I'm going to number my transformers. The transformers in the field are numbered also. T1, T2, T3, and T4. Now, hopefully when the weather clears up, we get an opportunity. We're going to do a walkthrough of the college feed yep. also. And uh, you guys are going to do an actual map for us out there on the college. We're going to do a walkthrough on one half of the college. Then we're going to turn you guys loose. And uh, you're going to do your own map of the uh, opposite side of the college. Everybody does understand, too, that that symbol is a fuse. that S symbol that you see right there. And that's what you will actually see on maps and diagrams also. Right. All right, so in normal operation, I <clears throat> have, have a dip pole. I'm using four transformers in this situation. We are talking about single phase to make this a little bit simpler to start with. And you're always in a loop type situation going to have an open point. Now this is important. If I have an open point here, it's meant for the T3 transformer and it's on the A side. Does everybody understand that? Okay. If I have an open point here, it's still meant for the T3 transformer, but it's on the B side. So watch where your open points are at. Obviously, in this four transformer situation, we want to split the difference. So we're going to come over here and we're going to have this, this dip feeding two transformers and this dip feeding two transformers. So I'm going to put my open point here. Now, this is what kind of confuses students sometimes. If I'm going left to right down my dip pole in this direction, and I'll draw the transformer down here again, just to emphasize. Which side do I go in on? Left. A and out. B. B, okay. That's pretty simplistic. In A, out B. In A, out B. When you're coming from right to left, it crosses. In A, out B. See that symbol I made right there? Uh -huh. In A. Well, it, A is actually stood off. Okay. And then B. So this is going to be a bad situation. I've got started already. I don't have any power going to that transformer. So let's control Z, 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 that one. Get rid of all that. See how far back we can go. Okay. I'm gonna have to come over here. No, that's that's wrong too. Do, do, do. To come <laughs> over here. Yay. There you go. And now we got it. All right. So NA out. NA stood off. B still coming in here, but it's not going to the bushing of the transform. This side over here. NA out B. In A, out B, and once again, we're coming down here and dead ending the standing off. So don't, I mean, I, this is pretty simple to understand. If I'm going from left to right, in, out, in, <coughs> out. Remember on your transformers, if you're coming from right to left with the feed, this direction is still in A, but it's out B and it crosses like that. So don't let anything like that there confuse you. So let me see how far I can go back. So let's start the first step here. Identify. Okay, so this will say this is poll, let me change colors here so you don't get confused. We'll say this is poll one. This is poll two.
the fuse is blown at pole one. Where was my open point? Right here. Okay, the fuse is blown at pole one. What's my first fault indicator? The fuse blown. Okay, let's go and to make it a little bit simpler to start here, let's use the fault indicator. They are installed. I've got red indication here. I've got white indication here. <clears throat> Where's my bad span? Between the T1 and T2. Okay. Remember, I go in, and this is what we do at St. D. Cooper. I go in on the A side at the B, and then I'm coming in on the A side that's showing white. So it could be anywhere from here to the input of A and the transformer of A. But you have identified that it is between T1, T2. False. So could it? So could it be the uh, T one transformer that was wrong? That's messed up. That's correct. Okay. You said the transformer of A, and I wasn't sure. Okay. What you mean? No, it comes into A. And let me get a eraser on that. Now, I, I mean, I'll tell you, but Professor B, you um, get your experience in on this one too. Mm -hmm. Out of the times that I've used fault indicators and gone to it, maybe one out of a hundred. Right. I've found a bad transformer. Right. It's almost always the cable. Yeah. Okay. So I, I did want to bring that up yesterday. They don't, don't discount it. It may happen, but almost all the uh, time is the cable. So, what was the first step? Identify. Uh, identify. Have you done that? Yes. Why am I not writing on the line here? Oh, that's why. <laughs> oh man. So you've got identify done. All right, what was the next step? Isolate. Isolate. So where is the bad span from? Uh between the transformer T1 and A uh the A, I mean left side bushing and T2. Okay. We're going to take into consideration here, and like I said before, we're thinking that the transformer is good. That would, you know, okay. we're going to always we're going to go ninety nine percent of the time <laughs> towards it being in span. So gotcha. we need to do. I know my pictures get a little bit full here. Well, is there a comment? Okay. I know my pictures get a little bit full here, but we're going to try to fill it up and try to clean it up as we go. You're gonna to have to get a little bit more descript. It is between T1 and T2. T1 and T2 what? And I'll, I'll draw that in for you. It's in between T1B and T2A. Does everybody understand that part? It's a three phase transformer, by the way. No, we're talking single phase. Okay. Okay. It's between T1B bushing this one, and T2A bushing, this one, in here. So that'll help you in the process of isolation. Okay, so what do we need to do? Our next step is isolate. What do we need to do to isolate that span? De-energize. It already is de-energized, the fuse is blown. Ah. Mm. Close the or uh, open the transformers, like the switches on the transformer? Uh, the switches on the transformer, I'm glad you brought that up. Both the switches on three phase, <laughs> primary side, single phase, primary side with a bayonet, or three phase, secondary side, single phase, secondary side, open any of the, any of those switches or the bayonet fuses does not stop the flow of primary voltage in and out of the transformer. The only way that you're able to stop the flow or isolate the flow of electricity is to remove the connection, the elbow connection off the transformer. 
So what do I need to do in T1 and T2? Move the elbows on the, Move the connection. Okay, hold on one second. See if I can, uh, I'm only showing the, what was the uh, part that I showed you a little while ago where I come up to a point and dead end? I can stand. Stand off. All right, so I'm going to, here, there you go. Stand off. Which one? T1B. T1B. T2A. And, thank you, Paul, T2A. Is that span now isolated? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, so you've done the identify part <clears throat> and that you have just completed isolation. Both ends go nowhere. They're stood off, they come up to a point and stop. Now, what's the last part? Restore. Restore. Okay. So I'm going to try to get a little bit of eraser business going on here so you're not confused by this. So what you have done, get a little bit more of that. So what you have done to these transformers right in here, right now, and this is the way the situation sits, is this is dead ended, and this is dead ended. Okay. Now I need to restore. What do I need to do? Uh, what did you remove that cable and just replace it? A new cable. No, no, that's going to take uh, probably a good portion of the day. I need to get electricity back on now. Hmm. So uh, where T T2 uh, B is stood off, hook it back in. Okay, so now I'm going to get rid of this. And I am going to put power to T2B. So I'm going to say, and this is the way I'm going to say it, close T2B. Just as a double check here, can it go any further? Nope. Nope, no. sure can't. So we're okay there. All right, what's next? Now I've got power to T4, T3, and T2. Do we have power back to T1 yet? No. Why not? What do we need to do? Replace the fuse and close it. Replace and o one fuse. Close fuse pole one. Cool. You did it. Now I have to be uh, totally honest with you. You get two people, and you do this three or four or five times out there in the field and you're working with a guy in a service truck or you know, you're not working with him. He's by himself and he calls you over there. Uh, restoration, especially in something as simple as this, can take less than 30 minutes. It's, it's rather quick. Now, you get, obviously you're gonna be working back and forth by radio saying I've got, I've found the fault, T1 to T2, uh, I show fault indicators. One guy's gonna go to T1, he's gonna stand off T1B. Another guy's gonna go to T2, he's gonna stand off T2A, all right? Now, typically I'm not gonna leave. The other guy that stood off T1 is gonna go back to the dip pole and he's gonna close the fuse. Then I'm gonna stand there and close the open point See, I never had to leave. I closed the open point, power is restored. It, it, it is a real quick and efficient operation. I will let you know on the safety side, and this is vitally important, you cannot re-energize anything without first making contact with the person that's on the job with you. Right. Right. Even though you've got visual confirmation here, okay? even though he saw you do it, and now he's driven over to the dip pole, you have to call him by radio and say, I am getting ready to close the open point at T2B. 
he's going to say. And uh, Professor V, with your experience, jump in on this. Yeah. We we actually had to move away from anything that we were working on, be in the clear, until he closed that and gave us confirmation back. He would say, I've got T2B closed. We would have to retest whatever we were working on. And I know it's just the fuse over here to make sure it was de-energized. And he would in turn do the same thing. He would call the man over here. I'm getting ready to close the fuse at pole number one. He would have to be in the clear and away. And then he would close the fuse. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that um, you may have two or three guys out there that before you re-energize anything that each person is in the clear, their tools are in the clear, the men, the men are in the quick clear, their equipment's in the clear, and you know, everybody's ready for it to be re-energized, whether it's the transformer or the dip pole or whatever. Mm -hmm. Remember when you thank you, Professor V. Remember, when you get to this job site and you get ready to move open points and move elbows and start re-energizing stuff. You're working with equipment and conductor <laughs> and tagging that was done by somebody else. Yeah. All right. Uh, you're working for a good organization and they're hitting on all cylinders 100% of the time. Confidence level is high. Okay. That's still that 0.1% of somebody that made an error in tagging or put an elbow in a wrong position. Uh, you don't want to take that chance. Well, you back away every time that you get ready to ener energize something and communicate. All right, you, you're standing here. You're, you're calling the guy on the radio. I'm ready to close at T2B and he doesn't answer. And you call him again on the radio and he doesn't answer. Can you just go ahead? No. No. No, no. you've got to have verbal confirmation on this guys. You've got to close the lid walk down to him, drive down to him, whatever you need to do is, hey, man, you not hearing me in the radio? Well, yeah, but I was kind of busy. He says, well, I'm ready at T2B. So he leaves and goes back. You got to call him on the radio again. All right, I'm ready to close at T2B to confirm he's back in the clear because you've lost visual contact with him. And there's a lot of safety that goes on because you're working with something. If you were on overhead, you could see it in the air it's visual if you're working on underground you're not 100 percent sure that the conductor tagging is right and you're working with the correct base i just want to stipulate that I, i've seen a couple of accidents occur because of that uh one was pretty pretty bad to where i'll get into another conversation about it we had goals for restoration of power mm -hmm. and uh it was a, a pretty big outage, probably about 500 customers in a subdivision. And they were using the fault indicator method and they were progressively restoring power through the subdivision and really not contacting anybody. They thought they had the correct one and <laughs> isolated, but when they got down to the last point to be able to close and re-energize another transformer, it was tagged incorrectly. And that went into alignment that was down the line no communication. And it was a pretty, pretty substantial error. Communicate. All right. Let me give you another scenario here. What time are we holding? Uh, 10, 14. Okay. All right. Just to kind of, you know, I want, to, I want to give you different situations here and, and kind of not really boggle your mind, but give you the different scenarios. We'll go back to the four transformer scheme. Still single phase. Okay. One, two, three, four, T1. T2, T3, T4. Let's go ahead and change to red here. Normal open point. We're going to stick with the uh, fault indicator method. All right. Fuse blown. Y2. 
white, white. Between pole two and T4. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, yeah. Is everybody understanding that, of why that is that case? If you don't understand why, please speak up and we can discuss it. The thing to remember here, fuses are your first fault indicator. A blown fuse is your first fault indicator. So you might as well just go ahead and consider that red. Where's the span between red and white? All right, so you've identified. Okay, isolate. It's between pole two and uh, T4. That's identify. Isolate. Uh, what you you dead in T4? Might move it to the parking stand. Which one? A. Hey. Oh. There you go. There you go. Remember, we got to, when we do isolation, we're starting to do the isolation part. You got to tell me uh, the T, the T1A or T1B. I mean, excuse me, T4A or T4B. So I've got the correct wire isolated. So we're going to yeah. take the inbound, and this is where it gets kind of confusing to people. It doesn't come in on the right hand side. We're going to isolate. I think I heard y'all correctly. T. T4A. A. A. Isolate is park it. Okay. What's next? Yep. When you isolate, you have to isolate on two ends. All right. So isolate. the fuse is blown on the other end, so it's already isolated over there, right? Yes. Uh, Professor Vermelin? Yep. Our practice was to take the fuse barrel out. Take the barrel out. Right. Flag take out. Fuse. Barrel. And tag. Slash flag. Pull. You might think it's kind of weird. You know, you work in some places, and some places, you know, when you're working on subdivisions or whatnot or, or long stretches, uh, you're going to be out of sight of people. Uh, and they're going to drive up and say, Hey, I, I found a fuse blown. <laughs> I think I'm going to go ahead and refuse it. I, I just saw it by chance. I'm going to be a hero and just refuse it. Well, if you drive up and see one blown, give it a shot. Well, guess who's working down here for one? Two is, and the opposite side, if I drive down here and I've got power out, I'm another serviceman or somebody just driving by and see it down there, there's nothing for me to close. <laughs> it's purely obvious. The fuse barrel is gone. Typically, we, we put it on the truck and ride it around with us until we're finished. And mm -hmm. you see tagging on the pole not to close the fuse. So that, when you do this, take out fuse, barrel, and tag, flag the pole. That's your other portion of uh, restoration. I'm mean, excuse me, isolation. Now we need to restore. Quick question for you, Shoemaker. You go ahead, Cole. If you find a fuse blown and it's still in the uh, the switch bracket, mm -hmm. can you call on the radio just to make sure is anybody working on pole or line number? Blah 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 blah. You can. Uh, What's going to happen here, you can call your dispatchers and he's going to give you one thing. He's going to say, I've already got somebody working on it. Or you need to do, and this is uh, going to be standard on overhead and underground. You're going to have to do what they call patrolling. All right, simply patrolling is on overhead start from the fuse and ride out the entire circuit. Yeah, I know it's time consuming, but if you cannot, first, you're patrolling it to see if anybody's on it working. Secondly, you're patrolling it to see what the problem was and uh, resolve that before you close the fuse. So you're gonna have to patrol, all right? On underground, it's the same thing. I've got a fuse, it's still in the switch, it's hanging open and it's blown. I've got to patrol, well, First thing you really got to do is I'll patrol and drive by 
all of these transformers. And uh, Professor V, you probably go on this one too. If I'm by myself, it might be a connection inside a transformer. So I will pop open a transformer, look at it, see if I see anything wrong, go to the next one, look at it, see if there's anything wrong inside the transformer. And I might go 10, 15 transformers and doing that, always closing the lid when I leave and relocking it. That's a patrol. Yeah. Okay. And then you've also determined if anybody else is working on it. <laughs> if I don't see anything obvious just by a visual looking inside, then I'm going to drop back and you're going to be in communication with the dispatchers. I'm going to drop back and what do I need to do? Start the identification method. Yeah. So here we go. Start to identify. All right. If I've got fault indicators, I start in that direction. If I don't, I'm going to start with phasing six. I can guarantee you, if you're by yourself and you patrolled it during, even during the course of patrol, I'm going to start calling other people to help me out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question, Cole. All right. We're here on restore. So let me draw in what we've done. <laughs> we've dead ended. I just like to call it a dead end. And we took the fuse away. We don't have any way to restore that power right there. We came into the A side. We've dead ended. All right. What do we need to do next? Mm, put uh, T2B from standoff into the uh, H2 bushing. Okay. I like to work, you use the word close. Close, close, close in a switch and open. So close T to B. <coughs> okay, now I've got power from here. I've closed. I'm in, excuse me, in and out of here, correct? Sorry about that. In and out of here. Uh, now something's going to happen here. What's wrong? Well, no, you, it's not in and out. You, I just said, what's wrong? Well, this this side is supposed to be in the B. I mean, on the right side, right? Okay. You had them mixed uh, closed, up. Closed here. That, oops, sorry. I'm in the eraser mode. Let me get in the pen mode. This is where it gets kind of confusing. Because this came from the other direction, it actually goes in B, right? To start yeah. with, and out A. Then it goes into what? It goes into B. B, and now there you go. Into B, and supposed to be out a but we've got a oscillated yeah okay that's what gets guys the most of them out there in the world this is what gets people confused is you got to remember the left to right right to left a and b's <coughs> coming from a different direction and that's where somebody putting the wrong mm -hmm. the wrong one in the wrong <laughs> hole oh well, absolutely yeah. absolutely now, as, as far as restoration is concerned, let me get a race on this. And we'll, we'll do a scenario and then we'll take a little break here. What time is it? 10.23. Oh man, 10 what, 83? 23. 23, I've been on this for a little bit. Let, let, let's try that. I'm just gonna do the transformers. One, two, Three, four. Okay, dip pole, dip pole. We'll put our open point here again. All right, it's supposed to be in, in A, out B. In A, out B. Let's mess this up a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna go in B, out A, in B, out A. All right, just to, just to mess up your minds. Once again, this is dead ended. When I go for restoration here, and we'll say again, we'll just say we've got a, a bad spanning here. When I go to restoration, my first plan would be to do what? Stand off which one? B. Or A in that case. Okay. My assumption here is the inbound is A, right? 
from yes. here? Yes. From here? Right. So I'm going to stand this one off. Okay. And my assumption here is what? Hey. This, huh? You would assume it was in A. Outbound of T3. Oh, uh, well, B. B. Okay. All right. Now I'm getting ready to restore. What do I need to do? T2B closed, which does what? Restores power to T2. I mean, T3A. T3, right? And then I'm ready to go to T4 and do what? Close in your fuse. Close fuse. Does it work? No. Yeah. Look here, guys. It's supposed to be an A. You're feeding B. Right. You're feeding B <sighs> backwards. Now, will it work? Yeah. It will work as far as restoration is confirmed. But here, here, here's the severe problem going in, into the situation. Once I get this put back to normal and somebody comes down here, both either T3 or T4 in the situation that's going on and plans on de-energizing the cable, not the transformer is gonna pull off an elbow and it's gonna de-energize both T3 and both T4 when they only wanted to do T4 and vice versa if I'm going back this other direction. I mean, it's an easily solvable problem. If I only want to de-energize T4 and I pull off the wrong wire here, I'm going to be de-energizing T4 plus T3. I only wanted to do T3. Gotcha. It's confusing, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. There is nothing on a transformer that tells you the wire is coming from this way or if the wire is coming from this way. Now, in the transformer, if you look at the tagging on the transformer, if you look at the tagging, and this one says 2T, we'll use T3, we'll use this T3 for example, it's 2T2, you know the wire is coming from that way. And it's this one, and I don't know why they did this out in the field, we did this normally. We had a two T2 and a from T4. Right. So if I'm at T3, if I say from T4, that means it's coming in here. And it's going to T2, it means it's going out of there. That was our tagging technique. You just got to look out for it. Even with all of that, somebody might have tagged it wrong. Yeah. Okay, so you got to be safe in those situations. And uh, do one more thing. We'll take a break here. I know I discussed this before, but just to make sure, I'm just going to draw one big transformer, primary side. There's the A bushing. There's the B bushing. H one A, H one B. Okay, inbound, outbound. All right. I pull off the elbow of H1A and the transformer goes off. Is it correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. I pull off H1A in another case and the transformer is hot. Is it correct? Yeah. No. 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 Okay, that should have been my inbound cable that's feeding the transfer. <clears throat> Let's use H1B. I pull off H1B and the transformer stays on. Is it correct? That's right. Yes. That is right. I pull off H1B and the transformer goes off. Is that correct? No. No. Okay. You have to remember in this situation too, and especially when you start moving conductors and you start getting into the three-phase situation, this is vitally important. If I pull off H1A and stand it off here, is H1B now de-energized? Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've spoken that before. I don't mean for you guys to get really liberal with it, you know, lay all over it and sling it all over the place. But now if I need to do anything with H1B, as far as training it around the transform <laughs> or, or moving it to another, you know, to a feed through, I now have now working with a de-energized cable and it's a lot safer. It's not grounded yet, but it is safer in that situation. So knowing which one, knowing which phase or which one you have on the stick is vitally important. And you're gonna tell the guy that's working with you, I've got the hot phase on the stick. The other phase is de-energized. You still have to treat it as energized, but you've got that knowledge going on there. If you pull off this one and the wire stays energized and the transformer goes off, you better let somebody know rather quickly, hey, I pulled off H1B, it's still energized. It should have gone dead, okay? All right, let's take, it's what? 1031. 1031, let's go to 1041. Let's get about 10 minutes and we'll come back and let you know what you need to do for the rest of the day. Quick question for you real quick. I'm on break, what do you want? Um, whenever you pull H1A off right there, like you were just saying, and you have two transformers to the right before your next uh, open point, you de-energize that whole line. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'll show you something here real quick. Hold on a second. Uh, untitled paint. Share. Uh, you can get in some underground loops and subdivisions and whatnot that can get rather large. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. Dip pole, we'll go back to here and put an open point. If I pull off any elbow, A or B, in the first one, no power to the entire line. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Once you break primary feed in any transformer, everything beyond is de energized. That's why we have the feed through. I mean, it's gonna be a momentary interruption if I need to change this transformer out. It's gonna be a momentary interruption, but as soon as I get A and B off, I'm gonna put them on the feed through. <clears throat> and it is removable from the transformer. So I can take the transformer out. Let's see here, there you go. Say so. I'm going to put them on that feed through right there, both elbows. That's liftable out of the transformer. Once I put them on back on that, now I've restored power to the rest of the line. Yeah. Okay, it is a momentary interruption, but not long term. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we are back. Let me get uh, one, minute, one more scenario going for you guys. So you see all the different types of scenarios that are happening in this share screen. Paint. Share. Okay, you should be my, see my paint screen back up. Yep. Okay. File, new. All right, we're gonna go dip pole. How many do we have four? Four. Thank you, sir. Four. All right. T1, T2, T3, T4. And we had our dead end right here. Drawing's getting a little sloppy, isn't it? Okay. All right. Fuse blown. We're going to go the fault indicator method. Red, red. Thank <laughs> you. 
Anybody want to, what's the first thing we need to do? Identify. Yeah. Identify. Okay. So obviously we know fault current passed through here. So it's that direction and fault current went to here. So between pole one and T2A? Yeah, but I'm still showing red here. So would that mean T2 is not, or T2B is not set off? T2B is set off. Let me draw T2. A, I've got my fault indicator here. It's red. A is feeding the transformer. B is stood off. Where's the fault? Between T2, B, and T3A. T3A is dead ended. Can't go any further. It has nothing to do with the left side, right? I mean, like, like, the remember, right side can't have anything to do with the left side. Guys, remember what, what, the, what the fault indicator is looking at. A, all right, B is here. It's reading T2 transformer as well. There you go. All right, there you go. The fault occurred in the transformer. Remember, it's watching the transformer itself too. It's on the transformer. So if you're showing red, red, the transformer itself is bad. Fault current went through the indicator here. Let me draw the red line on it. Draw the A side. Fault current went from the transformer. That's why I put this line over here. Transformer through the elbow and down the line. And it went through B and then went through A, gave another red indication and it blew the fuse. So the transformer itself is bad. That's a red, red indication. All right, let's flip side, Joe. I'm gonna keep the same drawing going, going on over here. Let's not worry about this anymore. He's blown. Red, red. Same thing, T3 uh, transformer's bad, right? Careful. In A, out B. Dead ends in T2. I'll draw it down. T3B wire. Right. Have an indicator here through the transformer and out. That's this situation right here. And out. Red, red. It's looking at the transformer and the cable that comes down to the dead end. Gotcha. So this one's going to be real easy to isolate, isn't it? Yeah, and you just take out T, T3B. Yeah, yeah, you take out T3B, dead end it. This one's already dead ended. How do I restore it? Close the fuse on pole close, two. Close the fuse. That's a real quickie. When you get last span, to the open point faults, very, very quick and easy to uh, remedy. Okay. So I've, I've pretty much shown you, but Professor V, unless you've got something else that you can remember, I've pretty much shown you all the scenarios that you can run into. Uh, white, white, that's first span because that's our fault indicator. Red, red means it's in our last span or the transformer. And then you know everybody knows what red white is. Yeah. In span. Okay. Professor V missing anything there? Just I would just want to add, just remembering your first scenario between T1 and T2, where you got T2 as a bad transformer. Um, don't don't put your standoff in T2 right there. Put it, make sure you go back to T1 because you don't want to be changing out a bad transformer with a hot primary in it unless it's you know properly covered and be a whole lot safer if it's just stood off in T1 where everything's dead in T2. I like what you're saying. Hold on. Did you do all this yesterday? 
because I'm not, I'm like, just be behind because of yesterday's class. Did we do all this yesterday? No. Yeah, I wasn't here for the majority of the class. No, we're, we're doing it all today. Okay. Because you said everybody knows what red white is. Well, I don't, so. Oh, well, fault indicators? Fault indicators. I've obviously missed something. I think I've missed something. Somewhere. We did talk fault indicators yesterday. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't here, so that's why. Uh, that, Paul, just to let you know, that is in the video that's posted up. Okay. Uh, I have to rewatch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Re refer to that video, and you, I mean, it's it's real. I'll, I'll go into it in just a moment. I mean, I'll, I'll hang around for you. Okay. That's okay. Okay, that's that's fine. So I'm just going to use the T1, T2. Hmm? Scenario that uh, Professor V was talking about. And we showed what a red, 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 red. Okay. Now I like what Professor V is saying. You can come into this transformer. We know from this situation here the transformer is bad because it's coming in here, and it's monitoring the transformer. If if you know the transformer is bad, you might as well just go ahead back one step to the outbound of B and de-energize that cable. There's no reason to have it in here hot to change the transformer out. That's the direction you're headed, correct, Professor V? That is correct. Okay. There's no reason to have it in here energized at all. Just step back one, park this, park this wire. Now every cable in the transformer is de-energized. That, that, that one's dead-ended, de-energized. This one's de-energized going back from this direction. So that, that is a good general practice. Anytime that you run into a situation where you can take conductor and not lose customers to be able to de-energize cable, go ahead and take advantage of it. Right. Okay. Well, Did you say you had posted that video from yesterday? Let me double check. I didn't see it. November the 9th, guess what? That's, I don't know why guys, but, and I'll repost it without, I got a copyright infringement thing and I, it got removed for copyright. I don't know what the copyright was. I do have the original. I will upload it as soon as we get done with this session this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. And it will be, uh, it will be titled November 10th lecture. And you're gonna get this lecture on, online today also. So, okay. Where are we looking at his time? Uh, 10.50. 10. All right. Before we close today, uh, Professor V, you want to make the announcement on the quiz? There is a quiz that's, that's going to be available um, probably around 12 o'clock, 12.30 at the late. I got some double checks and stuff with Professor Shoemaker, but it is, it'll be open till midnight tonight. So, um, and it is from, let me see, it is with dealing with the um, Dynatel fault indicators and the high pot. Professor V? Yes. Uh, don't mean to supersede you there. Seems how that recording got trashed. You wanna, you wanna extend that one day? Can. Okay, well, so, so that'll give you a day to study the recording. Now that doesn't mean you, you probably have two quizzes due by tomorrow, but that'll give you the opportunity to uh, get good eyes on that uh, class that we had yesterday on the video. So we will extend today's test until Thursday at midnight. Yes. And we'll have another, excuse quiz, and we'll have another quiz tomorrow on today's information. So we're just giving you, because that one video got hammered we're going to extend today's quiz. Is that okay with you, Professor V? Hey, that sounds good. Okay. Is that all right with you guys? Yes. Okay. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Okay. Before we leave, I just want to touch base with you. And let me get this moved over to here. In ELW 231, and we will take care of, Professor V and I will take care of this today. We're gonna open a Dropbox up for your resumes. Okay. We had talked about resumes before. Now, again, once you submit a resume, it, it is good, it's gonna be a grade. 
once you submit a resume, we've got plenty of time to talk about it, make any revisions that you need to make to the resume. Everybody should just get an A. It's not you're going to submit it and it looks bad. I'm going to give you a, a D or an F. That doesn't happen that way. You're going to submit a resume. We're going to get back, put our heads together on it, either out there at the field or sometime during class or whatnot and say, well, you need to fix this, this and this. Or I might just email you back. You need to take care of this, this and this. And you resubmit it. And then we've got a good resume and you've got an A on that. So do you understand that it is a graded item? I did want to give you an example. And you're, you're opening that Dropbox for that today. We will be opening it today. There will be an ELW at 231, not 211, because 231 is the last course. Okay. All right. When is and that uh, presentation is due Friday, right? That is correct. That is an ELW 211. All right. Okay. Uh, you have until, what was the last day? V? December Friday. 12th? Friday. December 12th for the uh, end of classes? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have yeah. until December 12th to have a good resume in the Dropbox. Okay. So let me give a share right here real quick. And this this is one of your guys, V. Which Ooh, one? Chad, did your son ever sell that truck? Who was this? William Kennedy. That was me. No, sir. No, sir. And he's not going to. He got an offer the other day at, at 12. Wow. From a boy and Aner. And he's keeping it. All right. Share a screen. We're going to go to resume. Share. Now, this is an example of a previous. Can you all see that? Yes. OK. Yes. This is an uh, example of a previous student. And I do want to put some uh, a little bit of detail to this. Uh, we talked about it before out there at the field. The last position at Santee Cooper for the line technician sees they had three positions open. They had 430 something applicants. Hmm. Uh, your resume gets down to Monk's Corner. That's where the main office is. Do you think there, there's somebody sitting in a room that's reading everybody's resume? No. No, okay. These are gonna go through what they call OCR. They're gonna be scanned. And the computer software is gonna be looking for keywords inside your resume that's gonna say, well, yep, yeah, uh, this one passes the grade. It's okay by the filters that I have put in there for the keywords that I want. And I'm gonna move it on to somebody to actually put eyes on it. You'd be very surprised that those 430, maybe a hundred made it through. So it's vitally important. Uh, you, you're relying on a machine for you to get your resume moved on down the line. So we've got Michael Willis in here. Where, where'd he go, V? Uh, Didn't he go to Duke? No, that was Lesnick going to Duke. Lesnick, Nick Lesnick. Wilson is uh, with Pike, I believe now. Pike Electric, okay. So uh, this is, you don't have to get, and you know, we want to utilize as much space as we can first, how many pages is a resume? One. One and one only. Okay, we did work on this one eventually to get this thing squared away down to one page. <laughs> but you want one and one only page, all right? Michael Willison, phone number, email address. Uh, might as well talk about it now, guys. If you've got voicemail on your phone, make it professional. And when I say professional, it doesn't have to be anything that's, you know, with hold music of elevator music or anything like that. But, you know, you've reached Michael Woolison, please leave a message after the tone, something like that. You guys that are, you know, got, uh, I'm a redneck and country music and all that kind of stuff going on in your voicemail messages. It's, uh, it's just not that professional. All right, make sure you give them a good current number. <laughs> make sure you give them a number that's reachable. I, don't, I can't quite, I scratched my head on this one. I've got the phone numbers from the last class. You try to call them back, not a valid number. No, no voicemail set up at all. So make sure you've got all those things taken care of with your phone number. And you check, once you apply for your job, how often should you check your email? Every day. 
Every day. Once a day. I, I, I go about three times a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Okay? And well, my, my phone goes off continuously. But make sure you've got a valid email address, and it's one that you check regularly. Okay. First part's right here. Professional summary. Recent graduate from Ori Georgetown Technical College, electrical line worker program. So you're looking at some key words right there. Graduate, Ori Georgetown Technical College, Electrical Line Worker Program. You will see, in a, and it's growing, you will see that a lot of the applications and job postings out there nowadays have preferred or recommended Electrical Line Worker Program graduate. So if you turn that right back around and put it in your resume, bingo, 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 bingo. It's gonna, it's gonna run through a lot easier. Seeking a rewarding career as alignment, hardworking, detail-oriented, punctual, and I always put safeties first. Safety, keyword. Prior automotive technician and Marine Corps veteran. I would include it too if I was a Marine Corps veteran. Now here's a space killer. Key skills, he's got a bullet here he doesn't need. He's taken up a bunch of space right here with bullets that I would probably put into a paragraph. Once you paragraph all this information, it's going to bring all these lines up here to give you more space. Now, as far as the timeline is concerned, you put the most recent first. So education and employment or Georgetown Technical College electrical line worker certificate 17 credits and the date. Now, keywords again, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, overhead, line, construction, safe, climbing, reassembly, structures, extension sticks, shotgun sticks, ground man, sagging power lines, communication, transformer banking, and installation, underground line construction, Digging and filling in trenches, mini excavator. Do you see where I'm headed? Right. Once all of this, and you got to think in computer here, once a computer sees all of these words and all these keywords coming in here, the confidence level just keeps getting higher and higher and higher and higher to move this resume on for a person to look at. Primary fault diagnosis, Vaughn, Hypot, secondary, Dynatel. Electrical line work, covered and implemented common safety, again, practices, alternating current properties. Then he goes on to, and this probably helped out a ton, commercial driver's license training, 160 hours. Key, that is key right there. Receive training and hands-on experience in all areas of tractor trailer, obtained, obtained a class A CDL. I'm not asking for it. What am I asking for? Permit. A permit. If you're able to put down that you've got a class A CDL permit on your resume, your chances of getting an interview are much higher. Then it goes into past history, okay? You guys that don't have much past history, I would emphasize more of what you did in class, okay? You guys that have a ton of past history, make it just key items, right? I know there's a lot more information he can add here as far as his military service, but what he does include team-oriented work, construction, heavy equipment, front-end loaders and bulldozers, supervised, safe again. And he gets this down, received, he puts that in one sentence, received numerous commendations. All right, gifts garage. Uh, repairs all matters of maintenance of small engines, gasoline and diesel fuel. And like I said, if you had cleaned this up, all this would have fit up on the page. And then Hudson Valley Community College receive associate's degree in occupational studies. I mean, I don't really care about that, but he does show that he's got a two year associate's degree. So that's just, I mean, that's a plain and simple basic right there. And, you know, Professor V and I have seen them. We've seen these ones that have you know, all this pretty design up top and, yeah. you know, bells and whistles and down the side here, you've got these beautiful colors. 
and it, it, it is all, I mean, does it look pretty? Yeah. Does it get the information across like it should? Sometimes not. And you're consuming a lot of space on that one page once you get all that fluff in there. I don't, me as a supervisor, I don't need to see fluff. I need to see information. Right. So that is a good example of a uh, well-made resume. So any questions there? Yeah, I got one real quick. Yes, sir. So um, I recently, I got like three resumes based on kind of, <laughs> kind of job I applied for because I've worked in a lot of different fields. Um, I recently took my begin when I, my work experience started when I was 16, I took that off because it was overseas. I was in another country, you know, so it didn't, I kind of didn't think it applied anymore because I've been in this country for 18 years. Do you think I should put it back on? It depends on what it's related to. Now, so I, manufacturing. a lot of my work experience is manufacturing. Uh, 24. Uh, you know, and I'm, I don't want to sit here and write your resume because it's, it's yours and it belongs to you. Yeah, yeah. I have had some students that have come into the class that are in their, you know, their mid twenties and they've got, uh, you know, four or five jobs at McDonald's. Then I worked for a car shop. Then I worked for, uh, you know, a golf course. And it's kind of a mishmash of stuff going on there. And I told them to get rid of the food industry stuff. Yeah. Now <laughs> include the golf course stuff. Why? Because it could include machine usage and safety and maybe apply yeah. to the job they're applying for. And you're working outside. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you can find jobs or experience that you have that relate to the ALW industry or the utility industry, include. If you got stuff in there, and I had. <laughs> well, I'm just going to include it all in. I had, I had a guy that put in a resume. And it was pretty decent. I, I mean, I liked it, but he had two paragraphs on a uh, marketing job that he had where he operated a telephone and he marketed, what was it? I can't remember what he marketed. Oh, as seen on TV. So he marketed items that, you know, as seen on TV by phone and sit in, sat in a phone service center. And that's what he did all day long. Well, he had two paragraphs on it. What's that got to do with the line work industry? Right. Nothing. I said, get rid of that. Bring in more information about what you did in class and anything else that's related to it. So if you've got stuff in your hip pocket that you can include that relates, include it. If you don't, if it doesn't, don't add it. All right. Now, I can tell you one thing, though, and Professor V, chime in on this one. And not to say that, you know, all you need to go in the service. Uh, utilities love veterans yeah they do yeah duke does especially and and they they actually have hr people that that's what you know they go out and look for it kind of like a headhunter they they're looking for these guys coming out of the military yeah uh, for for one thing they they know you got to be physically correct that's if you you know you got an honorable discharge and everything square behind that you're physically going to be good you're mentally disciplined You've been through an electrical line worker program. I mean, you're starting to hit a lot of high points out there as far as veterans are concerned. That's not to say that you guys that aren't veterans aren't good candidates, but it does let you know that if you have key things in your background, uh, where's Briggs still here? <coughs> Briggs. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, have, have you operated heavy equipment or light equipment before? Yes. So yeah, that's obvious, include it. Okay, that directly relates to the industry. That's a good example right there. Okay, any other questions? All right, gentlemen, uh, Professor V, unless you have anything else. I'm good. I'm good. We're, I'll send out a text uh, when the new video is available. And we will also send out a text when the quiz is online and the Dropbox is open for uh, resumes in ELW 231. Unless there's any other questions. You say that presentation, um, the slideshow presentation is due Friday? Friday. It's Friday at midnight? Friday midnight, you are correct. All right. All right. Thank you.
All right, you're welcome. Gentlemen, have a good day. Happy Veterans Day. I right, zoom in tomorrow. Yes, we are. 90% chance of rain. Thank you. You bet. Mr. Schuster. Hold on one second. Uh, who was that? Yeah. Snelly, yes, sir. Um, I couldn't remember if you, uh, I know you touched on a little bit, but did we have field today? No. No. 80% okay. chance of rain today, and you've got plenty of work to do this afternoon anyway. Yes, sir. Okay, man. All righty. Thank you. You bet. Have a good day. You too, buddy. Uh, Mr. Schumacher, um, I was wondering if we could get in with a uh, talk about those questions and stuff. Get in and talk about like interview the last way or the interview or the last quick what Hyman? What do you want? Interview question. Hey, right Professor now. Schumacher. Whoa, 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 whoa! Too many questions at one time. No, it's not a question, Cooper. bud. My stand by one, Mr. Cooper. Go ahead with your Bro, question, please. Fuck. I was wondering if we could get in and talk about uh, like some interview questions or whatnot. What I messaged you about it yesterday. What you doing this afternoon? Uh, a whole lot of nothing. Studying okay. CDL. Studying CDL? Right. You want to meet us back at one o'clock? That's cool with me. How about you, Kennedy? You too? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I come so, back uh, to you, uh, Who is that? Briggs. Can you want to come back at one o'clock? Yeah, for interview questions. Okay, you can do. All right. All right. Hyman, do you have something for me? Your foot? Oh, I don't know what that was, but it was an awfully hairy foot. Yeah. Oh. Uh, here. Hyman? Hey, can I speak now? You can speak now. Who is this? It's Cole Templeton. I had to let you know my phone died. Me and Jacob are together. I've been watching you on his phone. You and Jacob are together? Uh, yeah, we're together. We're lovers, Shoemaker. <laughs> 